For most Americans, the two big concerns have been rising crime and immigration reform. Raihan Salam is the president of the Manhattan Institute, which equips people with research information and clarity on important issues facing our country. During our conversation, he offered a unique perspective on how to get places like New York, Los Angeles, and other cities back to safety and prosperity. Raihan, I have some of the most interesting guests coming into my office, and you are certainly one of the top. And so I'm so excited about this conversation. To start, let's just talk about your background. You run the Manhattan Institute, which is one of the places that we go to to find scholars and learn things. How did you get there? And just what is the Manhattan Institute charter to do? The Manhattan Institute is uh, is a research and advocacy organization based in New York City that is really focused on America and its great cities, economic opportunity, individual liberty, and public safety and the rule of law. These are core, core issues for us. And one thing that makes us different is that we're headquartered in New York City, but also we're rooted in urban America. If you look at America's cities, they tend to be one-party states. They tend to be political monopolies, despite the fact that when you look at the people living in those communities, they tend to embrace school choice. They believe in lower taxes. They believe in um, seeing to it that small businesses are regulated thoughtfully, not over-regulated, not run out of business, and they care very deeply about public safety. There is a pragmatic metropolitan majority in this country, and they're clamoring for some kind of alternative. We exist to provide that alternative in those parts of the country that desperately need one. Who are the people that work for the Manhattan Institute, and what do you guys actually do there? We are home to a wide range of scholars working on a number of issues. We have a team focused on policing and public safety. Uh, we do a lot of work on educational pluralism, educational freedom, uh, and a range of different core economic freedom issues, uh, including housing, including uh, fiscal policy, you name it. Um, in terms of the scholars uh, we draw, we really attract a certain kind of person, a person who um, doesn't just want to preach to the choir, someone who wants to go into hostile territory and make their case and win hearts and minds. So we really try to find people with an activist mentality. Uh, of course, we have scholars, we have you know PhD researchers, but we also have people who are trained as investigative journalists. Uh, we have people who really are in the business, not just of researching and developing policy solutions, but also of changing minds. Um, some of your viewers might know Heather McDonald mm -hmm. and Chris Rufo, uh, Ralph Manguel, Nicole Jolinas. We have a, a wide range of people uh, who really have that in common. They have a certain intensity and energy in common. They have intellectual seriousness in common. Uh, and uh, we're really proud to have such a great team. I love that your scholars are fearless. And I love that you're fearless. Will you share with me some of the most proud moments that you've had through your leadership at Manhattan Institute? Anything that you can think of that you just love that you guys have been able to do? I will say that the conversation about crime and public safety in our country has changed dramatically. It's changed dramatically despite the fact that there are many people in mainstream media, mainstream academia, who wanted to pretend like nothing was happening. They wanted to pretend that things were perfectly fine. How dare you point to the fact that we have more chronically mentally ill street homeless, uh, that you're seeing a huge surge in quality of life crimes in cities around the country. We basically set up our policing and public safety team to bring reality into the conversation. Um, you know, it's something that I just found immensely frustrating. We kept getting people with deep expertise, people who spent decades of their life in police forces as prosecutors who came to us and said, we don't have anyone to tell our story. Heather McDonald is someone who, you know, I think has done an incredible job of really telling those stories. And then we thought, you know, there's so much to be done here. And that's a big part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to get reality into the front page. And we've had to force that to happen because it's almost as though when you have a monopoly, when you don't have these other actors who are willing to tell the truth, 
you'll create this reality distortion field. So I really believe that MI um, in the last couple of years has really forced that issue onto the front page in a way that I think is already yielding some policy change uh, that we think is going to be very, very positive for the country. I'm going to want to talk to you about some of these policies that are ruining American cities. But before we talk about those policies, how did you get to this position? Uh, I was very, very lucky. Um, I was a journalist for many years. Uh, right after I graduated from college, uh, I, you know, that was my first job. I thought perhaps I'd go back to school, and I wound up just sticking with it. Um, I worked at a pretty wide range of organizations. I worked at the New Republic, um, at the time a liberal magazine. Today, I would describe it as more um, leftist. Uh, I don't think that they would object to that. Um, and I worked uh, at the New York Times, at NBC News, um, at The Atlantic. I worked at many different organizations where I'd say, you know, I was used to being in the minority. But early in my career, I worked at many organizations where I do think that people might have had a different ideological perspective than I did, but they shared my desire to, generally speaking, um, be broad-minded, uh, to welcome dissenting ideas. Um, they cared about free speech and free inquiry. Um, and I will tell you that a lot of those people I worked alongside, they still hold those values in many cases, but they now find themselves badly outnumbered by people who have a very different perspective. You know, maybe they share the same ideals in principle, but they have very different ideas about how an organization ought to be run, what journalism really is. Um, I'd say that there's a generation of people now in newsrooms who do not believe in journalism as a truth-seeking enterprise, but rather they see it as a way to massage and manipulate so as to yield certain conclusions. They do not recognize the legitimacy of um, opposition. They are very quick to condemn people who disagree with them about very contentious uh, ideas that are not necessarily grounded in evidence as dangerous rather than actually engaging with these ideas. I don't want to say that's true of every single institution. There are some places where you have people of goodwill and integrity who are fighting a rear guard action to still preserve uh, those values and ideals. Uh, but I definitely think there's been a big, big cultural shift. So after I was in, you know, a lot of those more call them mainstream media outlets, I went to work for National Review. And uh, I was very proud uh, to be there. It's a terrific organization. I was the executive editor. But throughout my career, my real passion was identifying talent, finding bright, talented people, and helping them make their way. And I think that that's um, a big part of why uh, I came uh, to this role at the Manhattan Institute. You mentioned your disappointment with journalism. I think many people in my audience would feel the same way. I mean, we don't even know what to read anymore and what we can trust. And it's just, it's it's devastating that you can't pick up a paper and know whether it's truth or it's just the opinion of a journalist. I think much of it also stems out of academia. You don't know if you can send your kids to school anymore and whether they're going to get an academic education or are they going to get a diet full of left-wing propaganda. You went to some of the best schools in the country, went to Harvard, you went to Cornell before that. And I think you and I both agree that as we look at Ivy League schools in America and schools in general, things have changed tremendously. And somewhat the same change that we're seeing in journalism has happened possibly even beforehand in, in universities. And so I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts and what is happening at Harvard and some of these Ivy League schools? I would describe it as the challenge of information abundance. Uh, there are a lot of really great thinkers, Martin Gurry, uh, Andre Mir, both of whom have written for City Journal, who have looked at what happens when information is more readily available to ordinary citizens. It effectively saps the authority of some of those institutions that used to be accustomed to being in that monopoly position. Now, there are a number of ways to react to that. One reaction you could have is, Okay, fair enough. Uh, my uh, public is not going to take my views on faith. They're not going to embrace my authority. Therefore, I need to adapt to this new environment, and I need to hold myself to a higher standard of scrutiny. That's one healthy reaction. The reaction you've seen from many elite institutions is a sense of frustration, anger, rage over the fact that their authority has declined. Rather than say, 
let's react to this in a constructive, healthy way, recognize we don't have a monopoly on the truth, and let's adapt. They adapt by saying, we must attack any dissenting view as misinformation, disinformation. That's how we're going to characterize it. There have always been people who have their own views. Um, you know, sometimes they get things right, sometimes they get things wrong. But now those different ideas are being surfaced and they are being, in some cases, oversimplified, caricatured, demonized, attacked. And it creates this really poisonous dynamic in which you have elite institutions that feel their authority is going away and they lash out angrily. And they say, the only reason our authority is declining is because people have been misled or manipulated. Then you have people who are on the outside who say, I'm not going to trust anything that comes from these places. And, you know, both things have their downsides, right? I would love to have institutions that really are truth-seeking, that care about getting it right, that have a sense of integrity, and that we could trust. We just don't have a lot of them right now. I think Manhattan Institute endeavors to be one of them. PragerU is one of them, uh, and I'm very proud of that. But I would love it if the major news networks and what have you really embrace that ethic. They just don't right now. They're really in a state of crisis that has been very corrosive. And when it comes to higher education, you have these universities that represent a very narrow slice of the country, a narrow slice of upper middle class and better off people living in a handful of cities, a handful of communities. Um, you know, they care about admitting one student from the Mountain West or something like that, one student from this or that place, and they'll typically be from a college town or they'll be someone who demonstrates they adhere to the ideology that is already dominant in those spaces. These places have also torched their credibility. Why should I defer to you? Why should I embrace this idea that you are elite, that you have this authority, when you are so incredibly narrow and so contemptuous uh, of people who hold other views? Um, that, I think, has been really, really bad for those institutions. I think it's been bad for the country, too. I mean, once upon a time, parents would send their kids off to college to actually broaden their kids' intellectual boundaries, right? So they can hear multiple perspectives and make up their own decisions. I think most Americans would agree that if you send your kids to college now, the experience is not necessarily wrestling with difficult ideas. It's the opposite, right? It's a, it's a coddling of, of, of these American kids. It's making sure that they feel comfortable or, or even worse, maybe even indoctrinated with a certain left-wing agenda. And the hard part, I think, for many Americans Americans is that these are oftentimes institutions that are supported by taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're paying into a system that is actually not supporting our values. And the scary part of it is not just the money. It's we're sending our own kids. And so what happens when half of America has this expectation that we send our kids to an institution that essentially would play Russian roulette with our kids' minds. And I, you know, I think things have changed so much since when you went to Harvard and I went to UCLA where our parents sent us there Yes, these schools maybe would lean a little more to the left, but it wasn't this hostile environment towards conservative ideas. You know, what do we do now? I mean, you have kids, you have little girls, and I have I have three little kids. I'm like, I, I honestly question whether I should send them to college one day. Do I want my kids to go to Harvard? Do you want your kids to go to Harvard? When you look at higher education, there is a multi-dimensional problem because you have a number of institutions of higher education that are very heavily subsidized by the public, whether directly or indirectly through subsidized loans, that are just not doing their job on any level whatsoever. You have people who have student debt without any realistic sense that they can repay it. Now, to me, that tells you that something is badly broken. Mm -hmm. Do we subsidize higher education for the good of the country, for the good of students, to prepare them for remunerative employment, to prepare them to be good citizens? Or are we subsidizing these schools to create make-work jobs for woke bureaucrats? My sense is that a lot of the time, it's more the latter than the former. So, you know, part of the story is that we have a huge number of institutions that are simply not getting the basics of the job right because they exist more as jobs programs for people who, by the way, oftentimes share a particular ideological perspective that they're really about the students at all. So that's one big problem. Then when you talk about elite higher education, 
Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. You know, you and I both run nonprofit organizations. We take that seriously. Our mission is to educate. Our mission is to inform, to enrich public discourse. And, you know, that means something. When I look at a lot of elite universities, they are notionally nonprofit institutions as well. Yet, with the vast resources at their disposable, uh, uh, resources that, you know, would be unimaginable to us. You know, it's really just on a different planet. Um, are they actually doing something that is advancing the broad national interest? Are they really educating the broad public? Or are they essentially hedge funds with a country club attached to them? And that country club is there to essentially uh, entrench people in a sense of their intellectual and moral superiority, rather than actually trying to educate a broad swath of the public, or really trying to look at true diversity, not, you know, kind of cookie cutter census bureau, you know, fake diversity, but really try to have a diversity of perspectives, trying to find excellence um, in a number of different domains, celebrate it, give it a space to flourish and thrive. I don't really think that's what's going on. And it's one reason why there are a lot of people out there at the Manhattan Institute and also elsewhere who are thinking, do we need a different approach to higher education altogether? So, you know, you asked me a personal question, and I'll just say, you know, my kids are very, very little right now. Um, what I'd say is wherever they go, whatever they do, I want them to be prepared. Do not take things on authority. If you are going to go to community college, if you are not going to go to college at all, if you're going to get a job straight away, if you're going to go to one of these elite schools, do not be cowed. Do not be intimidated. Learn what you can, but understand what you're getting yourself into. So I mean, that's what I would say to parents uh, that you know you don't necessarily have to be afraid of these places because you know they might try to indoctrinate you. But if you're someone who has gotten a serious intellectual grounding through PragerU, through the Manhattan Institute, if you have your own kind of independent um, views that you develop. Um, through the hard work of a citizen, of kind of making discerning judgments, you will be just fine. Um, it's true that the climate is really, really quite awful. That really affects, in particular, researchers, scholars, people who want to do the work of interpreting and teaching American history, people who want to um, you know, pursue breakthroughs in the social sciences. Those are the people I feel for because those are people who could be doing great things. Um, you know, we have a number of scholars who uh, teach at elite universities. I don't want to put words in anyone's mouths, but I will say that the people who do the most path-breaking, bold work, the people who are true truth seekers, who do it without fear or favor, and are not just selecting their findings um, in accordance with the political fashions of the time, you know, uh, they find it challenging. Uh, and I think that that is very dangerous because these institutions could be a great resource for our country. And anyway, that, that's been a big problem. I mean, what's incredible is that so many of our donors, I'm sure you have donors who say, well, I'll give to my alma mater because I will give to the STEM programs. And so part of it is, you know, sometimes the, the money is fungible, but even STEM is becoming woke now. I've been reading about multiple professors who can't even talk about biology because now biology has become, you know, woke and you can't say whether, you know, it's a female or a male. You can't even talk about animals anymore in terms of males and females. And so it's just so... I mean, it's just so disruptive. And when you send your kids for four years, you, you while you do want to inoculate them and parents need to do all the work in advance to make sure that their kids, you know, are are prepared and know where they come from and therefore where and and where they're headed. But it is quite a tall order to put on parents and also on on these, you know, young 18-year-olds who we know the type of impact that their environment is going to have on them. And so, you know, I can tell, definitely understand yeah. why so many parents are afraid um, and and really don't know. And then the other thing that you and I often talk about is we talk about policy and the importance of policy, but we also talk about the importance of the culture, right? And, and how the culture has an impact on the conversation. And so we have a culture that still today requires or anticipates that the more successful person in America is one who does go to college, right? How dare you, you know, not, you know, raise kids who can go to college. And, you know, it, it, my, in my background, my family, if you don't, don't go to college, it means that you didn't work hard enough, right? I'd hope that that can change in America because 
first of all, there are so many trade schools that are incredibly effective, but our culture doesn't celebrate the trade yes. schools. They continue to celebrate the universities that you and I have gone to, right? Um, and so I think that's one very important element is to recognize that maybe not everybody has to go to college. I believe passionately uh, that you're right about that. Uh, it's a huge, huge problem. There's so many young people who are incredibly bright and passionate where that um, that capacity is smothered and badly undermined by the way that a lot of formal education works. This is um, especially true of boys. Uh, you see a huge crisis uh, with boys and the K-12 educational system right now. Um, and of course, you know, with girls too, there, there are certainly problems there. And I really think there are a lot of young people who find their brains, their energies activated by work, mm -hmm. by getting a job, by earning money, by taking on responsibility, um, you know, this idea that you are part of a team, you must get certain things done at a certain time, creativity has a role, but also just those basics of responsibility, taking ownership. Uh, and I really believe that that's a huge loss. And you're right, I mean, just about the status element of it. There are many, many Americans who've never been to higher education, who make a great living, and who, by the way, are incredibly intellectually curious people who are active and engaged citizens. That happens, that is more than a possibility. Uh, and I think it's something we should absolutely celebrate. And I actually think that now, partly because of the ideological climate and elite higher education, I think these institutions are undermining themselves they are marginalizing themselves. And I think that there are a lot of younger people who are thinking in a more granular, pragmatic way about their education. Uh, they are thinking, look, uh, does it make more sense for me to take a gap year, to work for a few years, and then make a decision about whether or not this investment makes sense? And by the way, thinking about it as an investment thinking about it as something that is not just a default option. It's incredible to me uh, that you see a big priority of the progressive left to make more and more of higher education free when the big problem is that we have a huge amount of subsidy here. Uh, and what that's yielding is a lot of young people who are frustrated at the opportunity cost, the waste of years of life mm -hmm. that could have instead been spent gaining real world experience. Um, you know, I imagine for both of us, you know, that experience of having a job early in life, you learn a ton from that, things that you would never learn in a classroom. And, you know, I think that that is so, so important. So my hope is that we're going to see new institutions of higher education emerge. My hope is that you'll see more people who will say, you know, I'm going to approach this differently. I always think about Israel. Israel is a country that, you know, like any society, it's not perfect. But the fact that so many young people serve in the IDF, when they do pursue higher education, they do it after they've had a very, very serious life experience in which their decisions, their choices have real consequences. Um, and I generally you know, would advise people, you know, if you're talking to your kid, uh, if there's an opportunity for them to do some kind of meaningful work mm -hmm. uh, earlier in life, I promise you they will take other opportunities, educational and otherwise, much, much more seriously than if they just expect this is something that's my right, I'm entitled to it, of course I'm going to take six, seven, eight years to maybe or maybe not finish a BA at someone, on someone else's dime. Uh, you know, and, and of course, you know, oh, well, there are subsidized loans. You have to pay them back. Well, do you? You know, it seems that now we're saying that this idea of repaying this obligation is somehow unjust, it's somehow evil, it's somehow, um, you know, some sort of blow against social justice. It's it's all very destructive. Right. Uh, almost every functioning business at least has some sort of constituency that it is um, responsible to report to, right? I run a nonprofit, you run a nonprofit. We do a poor job in our management our companies will not raise money and we won't exist anymore. The issue with, you know, these schools is that whether they do a good job or don't do a good job, they continue to exist because, you know, they're supported by our money. 
no matter what. And I think that is a big issue in that we can't hold these schools accountable. And if society could hold these schools accountable and say, well, these are actually the jobs that we need to fill in our society. And therefore, these colleges should provide grants for those particular areas of expertise. That would be one thing. But now you can go to college and taxpayers have to pay for for degrees and things that's, you know, simply don't bring value to our society. One thing I really believe uh, is that when a person defaults on their student loans, the school that they attended should bear some of the cost mm-hmm. of that. Now, what you hear people say when you make a suggestion along those lines is that, oh, well, then, you know, we wouldn't admit as many people. Or, right, that would enough, hurt kids that, you know. The, you, there should be skin in the game. You should actually take some responsibility for that because it shouldn't be an open-ended guarantee from the taxpayer. And, you know, when it comes to... Um, you know, how you think about public subsidies. I think that people should be able to study pottery and, you know, uh, and what have you and and clowning. And, you know, I studied social studies. Hey, you know, kind of, I, I'm happy that I did. But there should be some accountability there. There should be some accountability on the part of the institution that is making promises and representations regarding how realistic a path this is. You know, this is one thing that I think is actually, it really is an inequality. When you're looking at folks from first-generation college backgrounds, you know, their, their parents didn't go to college, it's new to them, they are really relying on and trusting the institution. Now, by the way, I think that, you know, you always want to keep your counsel and you always want to take responsibility, but that is a pretty common pattern. Mm-hmm. When you're someone who does have parents who've been through that, uh, you know, who are part of the kind of, you know, broad middle class, they can give you guidance. They can tell you what to avoid, what to do. And that's something that I think is really poisonous about higher education right now. It's predatory. Because basically you have predatory higher education institutions that are preying on young people who are vulnerable, who don't necessarily have the antibodies. They don't have family members to tell them that, hey, look, you know, I know you're really excited about studying sports marketing, but that's not necessarily going to be a path for you unless you have social connections. You know, that might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. Maybe what you do is you get a great job and you work your way, you build the resume to land that position. It's not good. I think that that is something that is very frightening to me because these institutions, they care about getting the subsidized federal loan. You know, they care about getting in those dollars. They care about churning. And if the student doesn't finish, hey, you know, no skin off my back. I don't actually suffer the consequences of that. We've created this totally uh, noxious system that's not truly private. And um, the kind of public element of it is not actually pursuing the ostensible goal. It's not pursuing the goal of educating citizens, um, enriching our economy, uh, our society. It's pursuing the goal of further bloating these broken institutions. I think we're seeing some of these ideas coming out really from a lot of the coast cities, right? You live in the belly of the beast in New York. I live in the belly of the beast in Los Angeles. Here we are, freedom fighters. Um, You know, we also hold in common the idea that, you know, the fact that our parents have come from outside of America, I think it's why we're so in love with this country because, you know, it just takes a little bit to know. If you look around the world, you see how incredible America is. Um, But, you know, what I'm experiencing in Los Angeles right now is just a deterioration of my city because of these bad ideas. And, you know, maybe we can blame you know, journalism for it. Maybe we can blame academia for it. But I think much of it is similar in, in New York and specifically with New York and L.A. too is the crime. Uh, I know crime has been a big passion of yours. It's something that you've been, you know, trying to lift New York out of. Talk to me a little bit. What are you seeing in New York? And, you know, what are what are your thoughts on that issue? What I'm seeing in New York is something, you know, you're seeing in California that we're seeing in many states and cities across the country, which is that over the past 20 years or so, there's been a kind of intellectual revolution in elite academia and media in which people have decided that many highly effective law enforcement approaches are racist. And this is a terrible irony because starting in the 1990s, what you saw in New York, LA, many other major cities is an incredible advance in policing. We really identified uh, effective, proactive policing strategies that helped stop crime before it starts. 
uh, you know, you had this big decline in crime in cities across the country, but in New York and LA, it actually went even further. You know, you didn't just have one decade of crime decline, you had two decades of crime decline in those places. And that, I would argue, helped counterbalance a lot of other terrible policies. You know, these are cities that have a bunch of other really brutal policies, sky-high taxes, uh, totally unaffordable cost of living, uh, stringent business regulations that really strangle the entrepreneur, all sorts of things. But these places got a lot safer, right? And that helped make up for some of that. But then now suddenly you say, okay, these policies that are evidence-based policies, policies that have proven their worth, policies that have saved hundreds of thousands of lives, overwhelmingly the lives of people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods, minority communities. I mean, it's incredible. This was something that increased life expectancy in our urban cores quite a bit. People decided this is racist and bad, and what we need to do is embrace decarceration and depolicing. Decarceration, well, basically, we incarcerate too many people in the United States because um, Denmark incarcerates fewer people, therefore we should too. Well, the sad fact is that our country has a violence problem. We've had a violence problem for a very long time. We have a violence problem in places that don't lock up violent offenders, and we have a violence problem in places that do, the violence problem in places that have effective law enforcement is much more manageable than it would be otherwise. We've seen that incapacitating violent people makes communities safer. There's a great deal of evidence for this. Uh, and, you know, basically we decided, okay, you know, because we have this arbitrary view that there's some correct number, and it is arbitrarily tied to some random country somewhere else in the world that's very different from our country, that has very different conditions from our country, this became a meme. This became this idea that people became obsessed with. And the people who were most obsessed with it were people who knew they're not going to bear the consequences of it, right? You know, whether they're right or wrong, they're still going to live in the gated community. They're still going to live in the building with the doorman. They're still going to be thoroughly insulated from the consequences of their decisions. So I think that that's basically what happened. It was this big ideological shift. And that ideological shift influenced some number of donors who said, ah, if we really want to change criminal justice, what we should do is elect new district attorneys. Let's go to the prosecutors. Because these bad prosecutors, they're the ones who are putting people in prison for long periods of time. How about we pursue this brilliant new idea? We'll get prosecutors who won't actually prosecute. We'll get prosecutors who will decide unilaterally that something that was a crime is not actually going to be treated as a crime. So basically, because in many cities around the country, you don't have competitive elections. People don't always understand and appreciate that those DA elections actually matter rather a lot for the health and safety of your community. Uh, so basically, it was an opportunity to, on the cheap, basically advance this ideological revolution. And unfortunately, the folks who were on the law and order side were either asleep at the switch or they were trying to raise the alarm, but they couldn't get through the media blackout. They couldn't get through this media narrative that these guys are all heroes. They're here to fight against uh, all these terrible things. We don't actually need effective policing. We don't actually need to put dangerous, chronic, violent offenders in prison. So um, here's where we are. We're in a place right now where you've had this ideological revolution. You have pushback. You have ordinary people who are trying to understand what the heck is going on. But, you know, it's partly a matter of connecting the dots and seeing to it that actually those people understand that you have the power to make some change here. I'm afraid it's going to take a while to make that happen, but I do think that people are finally waking up to the problem. Uh, and I, I believe that we're going to make some progress. There was a period of time where we saw that there was an increase in crime, and partly because we predicted it by seeing the policies that were put in place. I think we're at a point where anybody who doesn't have is not living under a rock can see that there is increase in crime. If you live in in Los Angeles, if you live in most of the cities within California, same thing with in, with New York, Chicago, all kinds of places around the country, you're you are seeing an increase in crime even if it's not on the news, right? And so what would a progressive argue against you? What would a progressive say, you know, against your claim that these policies are the ones that actually hurt us? What are they saying? 
Well, part of the argument, as I understand it, is that the crime increase isn't in fact that big. Uh, it's exaggerated. Uh, it is something that is a product of media hype and manipulation. So that is one line of argument. When that doesn't quite work, some people who are um, a bit more honest, um, some honest ideologues, and they're out there, uh, will say that's an acceptable price to pay because it is such a terrible thing to incarcerate um, a violent offender. Or, well, one thing you'll hear people say is that, oh, actually, we're not decarcerating. We're not letting uh, people go who are violent offenders. It's just not, that's just not true. I it's mean, just because they're smoking weed or something. Exactly. And they got sent to jail because they were smoking weed or something like that. Which is flatly true. Flatly false. That yeah. is flatly false. That is not true. So again, you'll have some honest people who will acknowledge that, hey, look, that's a trade-off. You know, you accept uh, that cities are going to be somewhat more violent, but we're still in the range where it's okay. And, you know, that that's just part of life in a free society. Uh, that is one argument you hear. Another argument is that um, the problem is police who are not doing their jobs. Uh, the problem is that police are pouting and they're going on a strike and they're not doing their jobs. That is an argument that I find particularly offensive, uh, partly because you know, you're essentially seeing the passage of laws in a range of different cities, which are basically making policing more dangerous for police officers. Uh, you are saying that you are not allowed to, uh, for example, um, restrain people in certain ways uh, that, you know, by the way, could be safe and responsible. You're saying you're simply not allowed to do that because we do not want to have any negative headlines. Um, you know, we just want to kind of totally zero out that possibility. So what you're saying is that we're going to make the job more dangerous. We're also going to demonize you. And then, by the way, we're not going to, you know, hey, come on, come on and join the police force. Hey, you know, it, it, it's crazy. But that is one argument that actually what you're seeing is um, this um, behavior on the part of law enforcement that is actively counterproductive, as opposed to acknowledging that there are people in law enforcement who feel frightened, who feel afraid, who believe that their city governments, that the local authorities are not going to back them up when they are doing the right thing, when they're being proactive, when they're being responsible, not using excessive force, but acting appropriately to keep the public safe. Now, I'm not saying that law enforcement everywhere in the country is perfect. One of the great things that happened in New York City and Los Angeles and other major cities is that you saw police horses become dramatically more professional and more responsive. Now, you know, again, that is something where you can always improve, but I would argue that the truly racist cop is the one who doesn't do her job. She's the one who doesn't actually get out of the patrol car. She's the one who says that, oh, well, you know, the only people who are dying are, are these criminals who are killing each other. Fair enough. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home and relax. I'm going to collect overtime and then let someone else worry about it. What we did, the real revolution um, in policing that led to these dramatic gains, was basically creating the sense of esprit de corps and responsibility, the sense that if you do the right thing, you will be celebrated and rewarded, that you will be valued by your community. Once you undermine that, the whole edifice can start to crumble. So, you know, there are certainly things that were done when it comes to, you know, simple policy. But also this cultural argument is really, really pervasive and really destructive. I agree. It's just another area where we have to, you know, get a handle on on culture, right? So, you know, first part of it is just the state of our education in America, as we talked about earlier. The second part is just honoring the police. I mean, I remember when I was an educator, we would bring police officers to the, to the school and we would have the kids meet police officers and we, ha we would have them write thank you notes to them. And now I'm feeling it's the exact opposite. I mean, kids are being taught to, you know, pull their cameras out the second a police car rolls up, right? And, and just be completely disrespectful. And so what happens you know, to our communities when police officers don't want to be police anymore and, you know, young folks don't respect any sort of authority. Are all police officers going to be perfect? Of course not. You know, evil comes in all kinds of shapes and colors and professions and all of that. But to give up on the idea of having policing in our country is just so dangerous. I absolutely agree with you. And I will say uh, we're in a very fraught time because when you talked about kids pulling out their phones, we're at a moment where a viral moment from one city can cause convulsions throughout the country. Uh, a viral moment, some of which really captured terrible abuses that you know we really should be concerned about, but also viral moments that 
are bereft of context, Mm -hmm. where you actually don't see the full story, and actually the lack of context is the point. And where you see uh, a media establishment that is addicted to certain kinds of destructive virality that uh, is shaped to fit certain predetermined, preconceived narratives, as a weapon against some of the institutions that are so crucial to this country's success and to civic harmony uh, and to everything that made this country a beacon of hope for your parents and for mine. Yeah. I mean, it also robs any any person in any any institution of some sort of like moral bank account that people can build, right? The police does so much good, but then one or two moments just destroy everything. And and that's what, you know, the Twitter mob does, right? It just, it, it destroys, it doesn't build, and it doesn't acknowledge all the positive. It only acknowledges the negative because the negative is what everybody harps over. I do believe in my more hopeful moments, which are many, (laughs) and I really believe that a lot of Americans are getting wise to this. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of people who have decided, I'm not going to be bullied. Uh, And if I'm presented with this preconceived narrative, I'm going to keep my own counsel. I am going to uh, basically try to get my handle on the facts, or they're just going to uh, discount the places that basically offer these prepackaged narratives about tearing down law enforcement, tearing down other key institutions. Uh, and I think that that's a big part of what we're seeing in the country right now. Uh, we are seeing a multi-ethnic movement. We're seeing a diverse collection of citizens in every region of the country who are saying that the rule of law is non-negotiable. And, um, you know, you can try to bully us, you can try to intimidate us, you can try to, you know, again, you know, say this or that. We are going to uh, really try to understand the facts for ourselves. We're going to believe what we see with our own eyes, and we are not going to go down that road. Um, That is something that gives me a lot of hope. Um, You and I are both from cities that have been dominated by a real far-left progressive establishment. These are places where, you know, I'm not going to say that establishment is going to crumble tomorrow, but it's a place where that establishment is facing spirited opposition. Uh, And I think that that's something that's really important, particularly for your conservative viewers to understand. Uh, One thing I worry about is uh, the fact that there are a lot of conservatives who really see our cities as a lost cause and who just think, you know, hey, you know, those places are going down the tubes and, you know, fair enough, good riddance. Um, But I actually believe that these cities are so important for our country, for its dynamism. They're such important drivers of culture. Uh, They're such important sources of our vitality. You can't give up on these places. Uh, Also because these places have an awful lot of people who think like us. They really do. Uh, And there are people who are very open to the messages that the Manhattan Institute and PragerU are offering. I see that all the time. I see that not just through my professional life. I see that through friends that I thought of as dyed-in-the-wool lefties who are questioning. There are people who see that the narrative isn't quite what they thought it was. They're thinking for themselves, and they are hungry for an alternative, and they're looking to folks like us to provide, and that's a heavy responsibility, but it's something that I find incredibly exciting and promising. I think it's also important that we acknowledge that conservatives need to stop running away from all things that we feel like we're losing at. And so it started with us running away from academia and, you know, we pretty much forfeit. Then we ran away from Hollywood and Hollywood was not always left wing, but it started it became more and more left wing and conservatives started running away or or kept silent. And now we're going to run away from the metro cities. The metro cities are predominantly left wing. I mean, you, you'll see that even in, in many states that are red, right? The metro cities will lean more blue. But it doesn't mean that what conservatives need to do is keep running away and forfeiting every single time because the left will just run after us and ef- eventually close in. And so, you know, when people ask me, and they ask me all the time, well, why are we running PragerU out of the belly of the beast? And I said, well, that is exactly why we're running PragerU out of the belly of the beast, because if we don't fight here, it will chase us down to Nashville. It will chase us down to, you know, other suburban areas where, you know, it might be easier for me to live, but what's going to happen to the next generation? What's going to happen in 20 years if we don't stand up and fight? You're speaking my language. Um... I do not want to give up a single inch of this country. I do not want to accept 
uh, that, you know, I'm just going to take the L. I'm just going to give up. I'm not going to try to communicate with this or that person, this or that constituency. That is defeatist. It's foolish. If I were to tell you 10 years ago about the political convulsions, the political transitions, all of the things we're seeing right now, the number of people who are really awakening uh, to the power of conservative ideas. Um, you know, people would have told you you were crazy. I actually did make these arguments 10 plus years ago. You know, I was saying that, hey, when you're talking about these, um, you know, minority ethnic groups that you think of as necessarily part of a progressive rainbow coalition, I, I said even then, you are deeply misunderstanding these communities, these constituencies, you're misunderstanding their values, what they care about. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it's going to go from one monolith to another monolith, but what I'm saying, it, it's funny, you know, the left uses this language of intersectionality, the idea that they're intersections, you're more than one thing. And it's funny because, you know, I think about the fact that a majority of Black Americans in the United States do not believe that race should be used as a factor in higher education admissions. Now, you can ask that question a lot of different ways, but the Pew survey asks it in a very straightforward way, and what you will get are majorities of pretty much every census-designated demographic group that says that we're opposed to that. Would you guess that from listening to, you know, name your cable news channel or name your elite editorial page? Would you guess that? Um, you know, what you're seeing is that there's this huge constituency of people. I don't care which party you belong to, you know, who you vote for. There's a huge constituency of people who believe in individual rights. They believe in effort, ambition. They don't believe in making excuses. They don't embrace the victimhood mentality. They embrace the idea of developing and growing and achieving. And they want to be part of a political movement. They want to embrace ideas that will help unleash their potential. I truly believe that we have a, an incredibly diverse multi-ethnic movement that is deeply in tune with those traditional core American values, and that gets me out of bed every morning. I, 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 just really what we're trying to build, you know, what PragerU is doing, what the Manhattan Institute is trying to do with everything we do is surface those voices that have been silenced for a very long time and let people know you are not alone. There is an army of other people who are just like you, who share those values. They might not look like you. <laughs> you know, they might worship differently from you, but they believe in the promise and potential of this country. And I believe that this is a slumbering giant that is going to have a very, very big effect over the coming decades. I mean, that is the beauty of America, right? That we all come together as a melting pot from wherever we, you know, all walks of life, but it's e pluribus unum, right? We, we are American. It's incredible that you wrote this book about five years ago, uh, Melting Pot or Civil War. I want to talk about it a little bit because it's almost like you've predicted this moment, this moment that we're in today where we, you know, the progressive movement has been so regressive. It's the most regressive and un-American thing to start looking at people through their race, through their gender, through their color, and, and just celebrate our differences rather than celebrate our commonality. And so when you wrote this five years ago, is, is today what you were worried about? I was thinking about this during the summer of 2020 uh, when uh, you saw civil violence across cities um, throughout the country. Uh, I remember actually being uh, in my own home. Uh, I had a newborn uh, as well as a, you know my older daughter and just hearing... Um, just the sounds of shop front windows being broken and, and what have you, and just kind of really thinking about how, you know, I thought to myself, I'm never leaving. <laughs> you know, I'm a died in the wool New Yorker. This is where I'll stay. But just thinking about, you know, what is this going to look like? What is this going to be like? In the book, I um, made this argument. I said that if immigration were just about immigrants themselves, just about people moving to work, then you know it wouldn't be terribly controversial, I don't think. The reason why it's controversial, the, we the reason it's a really fraught issue, is really because immigrants are people. Immigrants have families. And so a big question is, what will those families look like? Will they embrace American values? Will they be incorporated into the mainstream? Or will something different happen? And what I saw happening was this. 
a lot of the immigration debate, again, it's really focused on immigrants. It's focused on, you know, are immigrants criminals? Are they violent? Do they steal jobs, et cetera? And I, I don't believe those things by and large. Of course, there are bad apples in any category, but I generally think people come to work, right? That's what they come to do. The big challenge right now is that we're in a climate where you see from the first generation to the second generation that people are assimilating. The trouble is that in many cases, they're assimilating into an underclass. They're assimilating in some cases into a kind of oppositional culture. They're assimilating in environments uh, with schools that are teaching them that the mainstream of American life is a bad thing. Um, the mainstream of American life is out to get them. They are victims of history. I mean, it's amazing. You know, your parents chose to come here, and then suddenly we're teaching you that you're a victim, that you're victimized by this imperialist power somehow. I mean, it is really quite crazy stuff. Um, and so, you know, I think it really is true that when you look at many immigrants, well, one thing that happens, there are people who send remittances back to their home countries. They're really focused on that rather than, you know, the idea of becoming a citizen and, and someone who's kind of fully a part of the country. That often happens later on, you know, as you grow, as you spend time, as you establish those ties. It happens as you form a family, as you see your kids growing up and, and you have your hopes and aspirations for them. You become more tied to this country. But with the second generation, that's the swing constituency in a way. That's the pivot. That's where things can go really, really right. And you have folks in that second generation who really flourish, enter the mainstream of American life, become people who help build this country, build on its strengths. And that's something that happens quite a lot. But when you have these schools that are so soaked in this oppositional, negative ideology, when you're actually teaching people young people, that the way for you to succeed is to embrace the victim mentality. That's how you become an elite. That's how you become sophisticated. That's how you become smart. Not by being a naive person like Marissa or Raihan, who believes in the promise and potential of this country, but by seeing through its lies. Um, and, you know, I think that that was a theme that I think people struggled with. You know, I got a lot of pushback to this, but that was the core argument. Um, I was reading an article some months ago in a local newspaper in New York City. And it was just so crazy. Um, it was about this group of organizers, tenant organizers in New York City, who work with immigrant communities. And there was a Bangladeshi immigrant, my folks are from Bangladesh, who said, oh, before I met these tenant organizers, I hadn't realized that capitalism was evil and that I shouldn't have to pay rent. I mean, I'm, I'm slightly exaggerating here, but it was just amazing because, you know, these people who are the tenant organizers, they themselves are second generation people. You right. can guess. They went to UCLA, they went to Yale, they went to you name it. And, you know, they've decided that what they're going to do with this incredible opportunity that's been given to them, the incredible sacrifices made by their families, uh, what they're going to do is basically pour poison in the ears of people who might otherwise embrace a different mentality, not a victim mentality, but a but a builder mentality, a champion mentality, a mentality that's all about developing and growing. I mean, that, that to me is just, that's, I think, one big reason why there are a lot of folks out there, a lot of conservatives, who are very concerned about rising generations. They're very concerned about whether or not immigration is the kind of good old-fashioned kind of immigration of people who want to work, or is it going to be basically creating a new victim class? Uh, and that's the idea that was really at the heart of the book. How do we avoid that? I mean, the irony behind it, I think of, you know, my parents who came as immigrants and probably your parents who came here as immigrants, they came here because they want, they wanted financial success. They knew that financial success would also lead to freedom and choices that they would have, right? But now our colleges and our culture is teaching them that they shouldn't want financial success because capitalism is a bad thing. They came here because they wanted to be part of America, right? That's why they immigrated here. Getting, becoming an American citizen to, to my mother was an incredible achievement in her life. But now we're teaching immigrants, second generation immigrants who come here, that their parents were essentially wrong about this idea that coming here is a wonderful thing. And actually coming here is actually a horrible thing because America is a horrible place. But of course they wouldn't want, and so the, it's, it's so convoluted and it's so confusing that it, it you know it's just it's it's frustrating to see that and it's and, and frankly ironic right it's incredible when you look at the late 19th century um you know this was a period when you had so many immigrants coming from uh from europe uh later on from southern and eastern europe and um these are people who actually really struggled these were people who it's not as though they come and instantly fell into riches 
What those people did is they really struggled. In some cases, they were downwardly mobile, but they built a foundation. And the idea was that their children would build on that foundation they built, and then the third generation, then the fourth generation would keep building on that foundation. That is a really powerful idea. It's part of what has made our country unique. This is a country, the thing that really separates us is what you might call mass multi-generational affluence on an unprecedented scale. And when people talk about inequality and racial inequality, what I think they miss is that what most people want, newcomers, folks from minority groups that uh, you know have struggled, um, what they really want is to be part of that. They want to be part of that process of building something you can leave behind to your children. And one thing that I really worry about is that I think that in elite circles, there's almost a sneering at this idea of the family coming first and the family being this shared enterprise where success is like a relay race. I run as fast as I can, I pass the baton, my kid runs, but that it is not something about just being in the moment. It's not just something about what satisfies me, what makes me feel good, what makes me happy at this moment. You know, when we talk about that victim mentality, part of it is that we all feel like victims sometimes. We all feel sad, we all feel weepy, but then you get up and you actually live your life and you do something because, you know, wallowing is not gonna get you anywhere. You have some reason to not indulge that short-term desire to do that thing. When I think about conservatism, you know, the conservatism that is always really connected with me, it is this idea, you know, Edmund Burke spoke about society as a, as a compact, an intergenerational compact between the living, the dead, and the unborn. I'm just a link in a chain, and I have to do my best while I'm here to see to it that I'm, I'm seeding the ground for the future. We are not in that kind of moment. Think about deficits and debt. Think about how many people are not speaking up because they want people to think well of them and give them a pat on the back. Think about the people who are not investing and actually making the case for these values that have made our lives possible. Mm -hmm. That is a short-term mentality because people kind of believe there's always someone else who's gonna do it. Someone else is going to, you know, someone else is going to defend those institutions. Someone else is going to defend those ideals and principles. Guess what? These battles are fought and won in every single generation. We have to do it. There's no one else coming. There's no cavalry. It's us. And I think that it, it's just the, that's the danger for Americans. The danger is that our country has not been conquered. We are a spectacularly lucky, fortunate country. And that's the danger that people take it for granted, right? That's the danger. And you think about the first generation gets that. Mm -hmm. The second generation assimilates so quickly into taking that for granted. Somehow, you and I, all of the folks watching this, they need to think, how do I inculcate that sense in my kids that freedom isn't free? That this is something that is fought for and won all the time, every day, in every choice you make. And you need to do that for your children and grandchildren. I pray that your institution and my organization uh, were able to give those kinds of tools to parents and individuals out there, right? First of all, they know that they're not alone. Uh, secondly, they can draw from your scholars and the videos and the content that we make so that they can have those intellectual sound bites, so they can have these kinds of conversations with their friends, with their children. I mean, we just need people to be bold about it. Maybe this is what being brave in our time is. Maybe. Prager U is a powerful weapon for a free society. It's a powerful weapon for the institutions and values that make our lives possible. Uh, you know, I'm so proud that the Manhattan Institute has had scholars, um, you know, on your air. <laughs> um, you know, um, it, it really is an incredible resource. I think about, you know, myself as a young person and making my way and learning and making sense of so many issues that seem terribly confusing. Uh, and just to have that counterpoint, to have that voice, um, you know, would have been so precious to me. And I really think that we are minting, we're creating a new generation of those warriors um, who are going to carry the torch um, for a long time to come. It's something I feel very proud to be a part of. Well, I'm proud to be associated with you. I'm going to give you a superpower for 60 seconds. So your superpower is that you can go back in time and change any policy you want. One policy, what would be the policy that you would change and why? I am going to be a huge cliche and go back to Ronald Reagan in 1982. President Reagan said he wanted 
a swap. The federal government will take over Medicaid and states will take over a bunch of other functions that they will be in charge of. And this sounds like a very wonky inside baseball idea, but the idea was that the federal government does one set of things, state local governments do another set of things, and they can go their own ways. They can try different things. They can embrace different approaches that fit their states, that fit their values. That's what real federalism could look like. What we've seen since President Reagan proposed that idea is the total undermining of federalism, in which more and more states are basically becoming arms of the federal government uh, in ways that I think is really corrosive of the genius of our constitutional system. So that's what I would do. I would win one for the Gipper and see to it that his very important, brilliant idea actually came to pass. I love it. Thanks. Thank you. (laughs) 